to the Capital Mindset Show. Today we're going to be doing another subscriber request, and this is a long time in the making. This was actually requested quite a long time ago. And uh, this one is a Mexican company, so we're going to add a, a little bit about the nuances of investing internationally in different markets, especially in an emerging market like Mexico. So with that being said, I think we'll begin with the uh, price action, and then I'll coincide that with some of the nuances you have to actually watch out for. So these, these uh, risks that I'm going to speak about later, which is like in the next two minutes, I'm, I'm going to explain what, why it matters where it is you are from as an investor. But this is the price action of the company since the past five years, and this is priced in US dollars. So this is actually going to come back, okay? But in US dollars, it's down about 25.28%. And uh, so it's terribly underperformed the S&P 500 over the past five years. And you would think that the business itself was actually uh, underperforming as well or doing worse and worse and worse. And that was reflective of the stock price. Well, if we look at the larger term picture, it's only gone up 113% since its IPO all the way back here in 1997, September 19. So what's going on? Well, with investing in foreign companies, if you are from, let's say, the United States or Europe, what you have to be careful of is what we call currency risk, okay? Currency risk is a very real thing because your denominated currency, whether you are from, again, Europe, United States, Canada, Australia, uh, Japan, any of these countries, right? You have to be careful when you put your money outside of the country, you got to realize that the, that business may in, in, uh, earn its income in a different currency. And most of its transactions are denominated in that different currency. So should the currency fluctuations be negative in your direction for that invested currency, you would actually stand to suffer despite the business itself perhaps growing in that home currency. So I'll actually take us over to here and actually, I um, I hope this would actually like uh, zoom in. Actually, I'm gonna zoom in for you guys because that's that's a bit ridiculous, even for me. So uh, let me put that over here and then let me center this for you guys. So this is the Mexican peso in the US dollar. You can see since we started measuring or since this started measuring in 2003, it is down about 47%. So not only do you have to worry about the business underlying fundamentals, you also have to worry about the currency in which it earns its income, okay? And then we talked about this in the past with other uh, companies in different countries like Brazil, okay? So looking at Brazil, we looked at the Brazilian peso or uh, the Brazilian, sorry, real, sorry, wrong one, Brazilian real. And that one also had suffered tremendously comparatively to the dollar, right? And so the, the Mexican peso comparatively to the dollar has also suffered. So this adds again, that extra layer of risk that you have to be aware of if you are investing in a foreign country. Now, the opposite is also true. If you are a Mexican citizen and you are investing in the United States, you actually stand to benefit should the, the, this trend continue, okay? That's the key. If this trend were to continue, you would stand to benefit because if the currency of the country you are investing in, in which the currency that that investment derives most of its income rises relative to your home currency, you actually make that extra gain. You actually gain more in your own currency. Again, we're measuring it in your home currency, okay? Uh, you could argue, or you could make the argument in real terms, it's not necessarily the case. And in fact, all you're doing is adding layers of protection because maybe Mexico had more inflation in that time period. And then that's why uh, the, the, uh, the, the comparables are, are so drastic, okay? But again, just wanted to throw that out there that those are the added risks you have to pay attention to. Uh, one other thing that I wanna actually start doing is let me know if you guys want me to do when I do videos in the morning or anything like that, covering some of the news of the day. And I'll just go through this and kind of give my thoughts. Um, it's not going to be like a, a big or long thing. It's just going to be, you know, added things. So like, for example, right now, we know that United States is actually expecting to do the ban on, on Russian oil, which is, you know, actually going to be something effective at actually uh, hurting Russia. Uh, because right now, as of now, they've been exempt from that. But however, you know, I stand to benefit in that sense because my ConocoPhillips position is actually rising and it's allowing me to sell into greater exuberance than I previously thought. But again, that's why the strategy is to sell out in pieces and parcels, never all at once. Cause I, you know, it's, it's barely impossible, not barely, it is nearly impossible to perfectly time it out. So I like to do strategies and remove my emotions, right? Cause you know, if we were like crazy, the moment I decided I was going to sell 
conical phillips i would have sold in the 90s <laughs> but um you know it works out all right so anyway that's the disciplinary approach all right so going over to the uh presentation over here this is the business's uh presentation it is in spanish uh, so, uh, I, I will do my best to, uh, translate every aspect of it into English. So I'll just read it in my head in, in Spanish and then just say it in English, all the important bits. Okay. So again, we won't spend too much time here, but essentially this is a chicken company. They have 82% chicken. Uh, they also sell eggs. Obviously that that's a, um, a component of, you know, raising chickens over time, you, you get eggs, right? It's pretty obvious. And then this is like feed, uh, this like feed, but basically for, for dog food, cat food, stuff like that. So it's a very small portion of their business that might be a fast growing segment. You can kind of see here by the pictures, by the way. Uh, and then they also sell other forms of uh, food. That's just simply what otros means. It's, it's other forms of food. So uh, they, they sell like, this is a, a meat. So like ground beef, uh, turkey, hamburgers, and other things, okay? So uh, we're looking at their exposure. We do see that Mexico is pretty much their exposure. And uh, well, they, they can probably expand into more of Central America if they really wanted to. But um, they are also expanding into the United States. For this business, if they actually are able to uh, expand in, in the United States more, I think they do have business centers around here. They, this is their production center right here. Um, you see these uh, squares so that's that's a production center production center production center so they are all over mexico and that has uh benefits and then these circles right here you see these dots are distribution centers now i don't see any in the united states unfortunately so uh, yeah but they do have a production center in the united states in arkansas okay uh, and looking over here these are their sales so their net sales right here so their net sales is actually growing and these are going to be in pesos right here it says it right there so it, it's not in dollars okay so but we do see this is an example the business has performed well every single year growing its its sales um, however we do see some suffering here their EBITDA margins have actually reclined right and this is also known as operating income right because it only takes into account the operating expenses so operating income has declined that is unfortunate in terms of uh, relative to revenues, by the way. So it's a, as a percentage. Um, and then the, let me see if anything else here is really important. Um, oh yeah, right here. So this, this is actually really interesting because since the business uh, is operating in Mexico, any sales done in the United States, if the currency is beneficial, if the conversion becomes more beneficial, those United States sales become more valuable, right? Because again, most of the expenses derived by this business in, in its core is uh, derived in Mexican pesos. So if the currency benefits from getting a currency like the dollar uh, will, will be greater, right? Because again, if you're, most of your expenses are derived in Mexican pesos, okay? And then again, they are still a majority Mexican company. And so most of their sales are there. Again, Mexico is a fast growing economy uh, relative. We have to see because, you know, the political turmoil in these Latin American countries sometimes will surprise you. A lot of Americans become overly optimistic in the uh, future of a Latin American country. For example, my home country, which is now, you know, perhaps the ghetto of Latin America, you could say, it was once thought of to be the fastest growing economy in Latin America and to be the most wealthy uh, country in Latin America. However, of course, with political turmoil, which is why sometimes politics does actually matter for the uh, lifeblood of a country, it, it ended up going not so well for, for the country. So uh, right now we went from the richest to now the poorest. Uh, or, and I say richest in terms of per person or per capita. Obviously, Brazil as a uh, aggregate is obviously been the dominant economy in Latin America. Um, and again, Brazil, the same thing can happen. A lot of people I see are very bullish on Brazil. You got to be very careful, especially with the uh, uh, potential new politics coming into place in Brazil. I will say, for example, as a Venezuelan, my perspective is we call it the Chavismo, which is re related to Chavez, Hugo Chavez. So the Chavismo is what uh, is kind of like an ideology that's spreading. It's a, it's its own version of Latin American socialism that has its own aggregate of, of groups and parties and powers, and it's very complicated. But you have different aspects of it in different countries. Uh, and right now, the one of the favored to win in Brazil is actually part of this group, the what we call the Chavistas. Um, and you know, of course, as Venezuelans, we're very traumatized by the Chavistas. Um, 
where, where, which by the way is the still the current party that's in power in Venezuela. Okay. Um, anyways, aside from that, I just wanted to make that tidbit that you have to be a little bit careful as well as Latin America, because even when Americans get really optimistic about the growth prospects of a country, they'll, they'll surprise you. <laughs> so not saying that Mexico is going to shoot itself in the foot. Uh, this president has been kind of, you know, well, I, I don't actually have anything to say about this president. So because I don't know much, I'm not going to really say anything. So uh, let me see this. So CapEx, yeah, it's very similar. This is net income right there. It's very, uh, so we see it's up and to the right. So right here, we can then understand, remember the added nuance I gave to you guys, well, what happened to the peso relative to the dollar? So therefore the performance in dollar terms has actually been negative um, because we have that added layer that they are fighting against, right? As, as you, if you're an American investor investing in this business. Now, can that change going forward? Absolutely, but that's an added risk, okay? And then I think that's pretty much it that we want to cover here. So we're going to go over here to the model. All right, when we come over here to the model, let's actually take a look at what, what it's kind of pointing out to us. So I want to actually point out that over here, we have the Mexican peso variant. So we're going to kind of ignore that. And something just updated. And uh, we see that it's it's cheap on a P and a price to free cash flow. Sorry. Uh, book value uh, 44.61 US dollars, but a tangible book value about $2.10. Okay. So it looks like it's below a book value, but uh, the tangible book value, it's, uh, you know, it's way lower than that. All right. So return on invested capital is 9.59. So it's below market average. So I would actually like to see higher returns of capital in the form of dividends or buybacks. We do see they do have a dividend. It's a very low payout ratio, a very well capitalized company, not going bankrupt anytime soon. Taking a look at the revenue. Again, everything's been converted to US dollars in pesos. This would be a lot higher. Um, but again, we're looking at US dollars. So analysts do have an estimate of a reduction in US dollars. So this actually could be because of the conversions estimates, you know, they, they could think that the US dollar is going to rise relative to the peso. And that actually does bring down the uh, dollar uh, revenue down. Cash flows are actually estimated to rise up a little bit from 2021, but not reach the 2018 uh, anomaly. That's probably some sale they did. But cash flows are much higher right here. And then token buyback. So remember, we saw that and it's basically not moved uh, since. So taking a look uh, back up here, let's actually go ahead and look at the ratio. So looking at the ratios, we want to see some improvements across the board. Uh, but looking at the solvency ratios, we do see that the um, uh, total debt ratio has actually uh, come down. Um, oh, by the way, I didn't cover the liquidity ratios. The liquidity ratios look pretty good, especially now. The, now the liquidity ratios look really solid, really well capitalized. Uh, they don't, don't have any debt anymore, so they pay that down, long-term debt ratio. Everything over here is really good, in my opinion. Uh, taking a look here at the DuPont analysis, we do see margins are about the same. Again, they are in a commoditized industry, selling chicken, eggs, and the like. Uh, they had high points, and now they're in the, you, you could say, the average point. Operating margins have you know remained stable, declined a little bit. This is those EBITDA margins we were talking about on the presentation. Net profit margin has, you know, remained, yeah, and within, it, it's range bound, it's, it's normal. ROA and ROE, pretty good, well, good for this industry or good for at least their part of the industry. There's of course, Tyson Foods that we can cover in another video. And then ROIC and earnings quality. Earnings quality is actually pretty solid for the most part. Again, good business. It's just, you have to be aware of those risks when you're investing in foreign countries. So going back to the to the summary, oh, maybe we want to look at the, well, there's no sentiment ranking. And if we take a look over here, it's no sentiment ranking. No one's really talking about it right now. Um, or it's not even just measuring. So Bochaco, okay, so True Valley stock. So it's Guru Focus. Seeking Alpha writes a lot about it. Zach's, oh, the hype beast, Zach. Time to buy, you know, <laughs> business wire. Okay, so, you know, for the most part, people all think it's kind of cheap. Uh, very interesting in investment opportunity in Seeking Alpha. Okay, so. Interesting stuff here. So let's go back to the analysis and let's actually uh, pencil out some growth rates. So if we put a heavy discount rate or not a heavy, but a good margin of safety, we can actually expect it if it were to grow around the average, it, it is a buy because it gives us a very value of 49.83. Uh, if we do expect it to grow very modestly, it does have a fair value of 32.58. Let's see if it grows at 3%, we're almost there. I think 4% wins, wins the day. So 4% is basically there. Okay, guys, 4% is right there. 5% we're already there. So it doesn't have to grow much in order for it to be a fair value uh, here in the moment. Uh, again, if you want a higher margin of safety due to that uh, currency risk, 
you're going to have to get lower prices, unfortunately, for this. So uh, taking a look again at the stock, again, we can understand why it's kind of underperformed because under the backdrop of this, you know, it's very difficult sometimes to perform well, okay, because it's something that's kind of outside your control. It has to do with macro forces, not necessarily micro or it company forces themselves. So again, let's go back here and kind of kind of give my closing thoughts here. So this business is a good business. It's a good Mexican business. If it's good for an American or European to invest in this, I don't know. You have to go into this knowing that you are taking that added risk, uh, which is currency risk. Could this perform better in the future if the currency is more favorable? Absolutely. And in fact, that would actually be a boon to you as an investor should you partake in this Mexican company. However, you must also try to understand that the investing in a different country comes with those added risks, as well as understanding the political nuances, things that can change on a dime. Remember, Venezuela, we have that whole thing that we can talk about endlessly about. But on that note, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did like this video, go ahead and feel free to leave a like. If you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe and come back for more content like this. And then, you know, you might see your stock that you're looking at currently being talked about. Uh, if you guys have any questions on the accounting or anything like that, go ahead and feel free to leave a comment down below. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next one. Have a good day. Bye.